So I have really been transformed by the book of Song of Songs. I'm so excited to just share some of my heart with you. It's really the anointed dialogue between Jesus and his bride. And it goes from all of the seasons of our life where we start out with weak love, immature love as new believers, right? And then Jesus moves us through his perfect leadership to mature love by the end of our journey. And I don't know about you, but if I can find what Jesus is saying to me and even what truth I'm saying back to him, that is the strength of my life. That's where I find the the courage to go through all the different seasons of this life. And I just want to start out with just what this life vision is that the bride has. She, She catches something that's bigger than what she's seen before. You know, as we become Christians, new believers, we often come to Jesus as our Lord. And, and we think of him and we, as, as the king and we want to obey him. But something very powerful is happening at the very beginning of this song. The bride is capturing the second person of the Trinity as a bridegroom. Not just as a bridegroom, but a bridegroom king. It's like Christianity goes from black and white to full of color. It's like, you know, um, what it was like with Dorothy and Oz. When it goes from black and white to life now is full of color. And, And there's this beautiful thing that happens in the heart of the bride as she captures the bigger story of what's happening. And it's, it's like she, she sees the end of the story and she understands there's so much more to God. It's like the knowledge of God is an ocean and she barely has her toes wet. And so she begins this journey with this beautiful life vision. She says, draw me away so that I can run after you. And it's this beautiful picture of understanding that Jesus wants us to be drawn away into intimacy, into that chamber of love with him. And then out of the place of intimacy, we run on mission with him. We run in partnership with him. We often as believers can run, um, we, we run um, in our service for God, And it actually is, we outrun in service our intimacy with him. So it's, it's, we get about the doing, we get about the ministry and, and it, it's um, more than the actual encounter with the person. And that for all of us, that equals burnout for, for the believer. We don't want to be burnt out when we are, you know, uh, speaking of Jesus, when we're evangelizing, when whatever we do for him, we want it to come out of the place of deep encounter with him. So she gets this life vision of Jesus. I only want to do service for you out of the place of deep encounter with you. And that's the big vision that she gets at the very beginning of her journey. And what happens in her journey is very, at the very beginning, she runs headlong into her weakness. Uh, You know, just picture it with me. You just, you think you're radical for Jesus and you know, you're the radical one in your youth group and you're like, okay, what can I do for God? And you think of the most, you know, grandiose thing. Oh, maybe I'll do ministry or full-time I'll do missions, all these, you know, I'm, I'm so radical. And then, you know, you, you go to that place of, of, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's youth with a mission or you're in your DTS or, or maybe you go to IHOP KC or whatever it is. And, and you face your own barrenness. You face, you know, if you just have a jug of water and your Bible and you're talking to Jesus, you realize there's just not that much going on. There's this, this ache, this hunger, but you you see your barrenness. And so in the very beginning of this book, she says, I am dark, but lovely. This is in verse five of chapter one. And I just wanna briefly talk about this. This has been one of the most foundational truths in my entire relationship with Jesus, to understand that I am dark, yet lovely. It's, it's a paradox of grace, really, because we're believing what seems to be contradictory truths. 
I am fully lovely to God, and yet I am the worst of sinners, as Paul said. We're, we're experiencing our depravity, we're experiencing our barrenness, our sinfulness, our weakness, and at the same time, we're experiencing our loveliness to God. And it's, it's critical at the very foundation of our relationship with Jesus to learn to run to him in the place of that weakness and not run away from him. It, we, we really want that great exchange to happen. Jesus, I feel so weak. I just, I just messed up again. And instead of you know, going and putting ourselves in time out and trying to clean up before we come back into his presence, learning what it is to come right into his presence and say, Jesus, I am dark, but I am lovely to you. Speak to me in this place of what you think and what you feel about me in my weakness. That's the greatest place of transformation. That's really where we go from weak love to mature love. That, that doesn't ever, we don't ever, um, that doesn't ever grow old. We, we, we don't ever, you know, not do that with Jesus in our daily walk with him. Even mature believers, we have to learn what it is every day to go in our weakness and let that great exchange happen where we are well aware of our barrenness and then he speaks his truth of our loveliness into that place. Because as we hold on to our barrenness, to our darkness, as well as our loveliness, what's really happening is humility is growing in our hearts. Because those two truths are real about us. If we only understood our greatness in Jesus, our loveliness, we could fall into the great trap of pride, just like Satan did, just like Lucifer did. If we only understood and bought into our, our weakness, our, our darkness, then we could fall into condemnation and shame and it would forever paralyze us. So Jesus invites us in to both of those truths. You're dark, but lovely. And, and very briefly, our loveliness is related to God's personality. The, he sees us through his eyes. He sees the end from the beginning and he's seeing us through his personality. It, and it's, it's this beautiful thing as he beholds us and we are who he beholds. Who can argue with God? If God says that we are lovely, who will disagree with what he says that's true of us? We also have been given the gift of righteousness. In the day that we were born again, it was freely offered to us, this gift of righteousness, which in essence means that the beauty that he possesses, he imparts to us. The very beauty of God, he gives us at the new birth. And he also, one of my favorite parts of our loveliness to him is our eternal destiny. We are given this beautiful revelation in the word of God of who we will be forever. And ultimately, we will marry the Son of God. We are called to be equally suitable companions to the Son of God. We are called to rule and reign with him. And, and I don't know about you, but that changes everything. So. Every day we get this seed of truth found in this first chapter of Song of Solomon. It's a seed of truth that's going to grow into a very mighty tree by the end of this song. But it starts with just a little seed. And every day we water that seed. So as she's in this crisis of faith, of feeling her barrenness, she's like, Jesus, I thought I was awesome but I, 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 you know, here I am with my jug of water. I'm listening to my worship music. I'm trying to encounter you in your word, and it's just not happening for me, Jesus. And I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling embarrassed, and I'm just feeling my darkness. And in verse 7, she says, where do you feed your flock? My beloved, where do you feed your flock? And she speaks in these beautiful terms. Yes, you are my beloved. And when she says, where do you feed your flock? She's saying, where will you answer these longings of my heart? 
I, I don't know what to do right now. I, I've left everything else. I'm positioned position my heart before you. What do I do? And Jesus responds to her in the most beautiful, stunning reply. He says, if you, um, he says, he, first he says, if you do not know, and then he says, my fairest one. And I just love this. Before he tells her what to do, he reminds her of who she is. In my journey with Jesus, this has transformed me. Every time I'm looking downward, I'm looking internally and going, I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't like the yuck inside of me, Jesus. And he comes and he cups my face again. And he says, look back at me. Look at my eyes and what I'm saying about you, Deborah. You are the fairest among women. I've chosen you. You're my favorite one. You're all beautiful. I'm, I'm so undone by you. And guys, I just want to say, this isn't about gender. This, this whole book, um, yes, we, we are all, we're in this picture of a bride, but I just want to tell you that, that just kind of maybe find your own language because this is the heights of what God can tell you of who you are to him. From Genesis to Revelation, fill your mind with all of those truths of what he thinks and what he feels about you and that's what he's saying here so so i i'm i know that oh fairest among women doesn't mean the same to the guys as it does to the gals so find your own way of of how jesus would express his heart towards you as the chosen one to to be with him in the most precious place of fellowshipping with him in the deepest place of love. He's chosen you. You are his champion. You are the one that he delights in. So whatever language you need to find, he responds to us in the place of our barrenness, in the place of seeing our darkness. And before he tells us what to do, he lifts our face back and says, you've already forgot who you are to me. And in that place, he tells us again, this is who you are. Believe me, I am God. I am the author and the finisher. I have the final say, and I say, you are my beloved. And then he says, follow in the footsteps of my friends, of those that have found me. Follow in the steps, footsteps of the other believers, mature believers, and you will find me. And then I love as he continues in this chapter, he just starts declaring who she is again. Her budding virtues, he just starts proclaiming, this is who you are, this is who you are. And so friends, this is really the beginning of our journey. We never graduate from this place. This is what it looks like to grow in our relationship with Jesus, to grow in our love, and I just hope that you've been awakened more to this beautiful story of love through this first chapter in the book of Song of Solomon.